Good morning. With spring here, it is the unofficial start of marathon season. For some, it's a true passion. For others, it's a great way to exercise. A 26 mile course, it's not easy and it's not for everyone. This morning, Alexis Del Cid is testing her running skills through 3D technology offered at the University of Kansas Health Systems Sports Medicine and Performance Center. And it changed the way one teen crossed the finish line. So this morning, we're going to uh, take a look at that and we're going to uh, meet this teenager here in just a little bit. But good morning to all of you. It's March 29th. Thanks for joining us here on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. There is Alexis. We're going to get with her in just a moment. Imagine devoting your time to becoming a track or running star, but your feet simply aren't having it. Uh, my feet tend to like push in. My, my toes used to sit, seem to push in whenever I'm running. For this teen, this 3D machine helped change his running style and help prevent injuries like sprains, shin splints, and hamstring injuries. Joining us here in studio this morning is Dr. Bruce Toby, former chair of orthopedics and sports medicine here at the health system, and Dr. Nicole Yedlinski, family medicine and sports medicine physician with us. Also, Dr. Stites is joining us down in Studio B, so we're going to visit with him. Hi, good morning to you. Are you muted? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. All right. We're going to check in with you here in just a few moments. So we want to talk about this uh, 3D technology available out at the University of Kansas Health System Sports Medicine and Performance Center out there in Overland Park. That is where we find Alexis Del Cid this morning. Alexis, so I guess this is helping people improve their running game. Let's hear more about that. Okay, Jess, I feel like I'm in kind of a sci-fi movie, but that's really me right there. Cute. I'm hooked up to all these different I'm hooked up to all these different probes. Okay, I'm going to show you come a little closer. This is part of the running gate analysis program and there are these tiny little probes that Dana and Ryan have hooked up to me. They're all over my body, even on my forehead here. These will track the tiniest of movements with my running gait, and this, they can do this with everyone. And it will monitor the way your skeleton's moving, the way your muscles are connecting to see what you need to do better. I'm super curious to see what that running gait analysis system shows when I'm up on this treadmill. They're gonna run me through some practices because depending on what they see here, I'm interested to know if what I'm doing is what makes my knees hurt when I run a block, because I've always had a problem with knee pain. So we're gonna show you how it works in just a little bit and bring you the amazing story of a teenager right here in town who's using this right now to help with his running. Jess? Very cool, can't wait to hear. All right, let's check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson though first, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. You've got our COVID count today. Good morning to you. Hi. Yeah, today in the hospital, uh, 14 active infections, one in the ICU one on the ventilator, 53 in that recovery period. So again, our, our, our active infections are really what we are mostly concerned with. They're kind of really staying stable in, uh, in the mid-teens. Again, hopefully it will go down, um, but you know, one day at a time. And overall, I think the trend is good. We obviously don't have um, a significant amount of critically ill patients, so that's always good as well. Dr. Seitz, jump in here with us. I know uh, we have you for just a short while today, but um, just your thoughts on where we stand with numbers and what's on yeah, your you mind know, today? I think, yeah, there's some good signs out there, right? The numbers are mm -hmm. slowly falling here. They've fallen further in other places. so. We think that's good news. We still have 14 active infections, so there is still community transmission going on. We shouldn't get any sort of false security here from it. Um, the BA2 variant is on the rise. It's probably somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of recorded infections now. If you look at wastewater testing, my prediction is this, uh, Jess. I don't. I don't think we're going to get hit by the BA2 variant in the same direction that Europe was. I'm very hopeful about that, and here's why. You know, one of the things we've seen is a very little separation in time from the spread of Omicron in late December through the first part of this year and ongoing and an immediate um, segue into BA2. Because of that, I think there's going to be a lot of natural immunity. I think there will still be a lot of um, people who have been immunized. So, Hawkeye, I think we're going to be in pretty good shape. It does look like we're going to be offering a fourth in vaccination mm -hmm. for people over the age of 50 sometime in the next week or two. Yeah, you know, I would agree with you. And we were talking yesterday, Steve, you know, we were, we were kind of wrong when we anticipated these booster shots. We thought maybe age 60 or above, 65 or above, certainly there. Seems like they may be going down to, to 50 and above. 
Um, and again, I would also agree with you about the BA2 as well. You know, I, I think we are being optimistic and believing that here in the United States, and again, specifically in our community, we won't be hit as hard with a new surge with BA2. And I think we have to really clarify and qualify that as in regards to hospitalization, severe disease and death. And that's for the reasons that you said, you know, there is natural immunity that coupled with uh, vaccination immunity. Obviously we know vaccination is the safest way to get immunity, but we continue to have good evidence to support the fact that when you have vaccination and infection or repeated infection, you have good T cell immunity. And that is really what is going to save you from coming to the hospital going to the ICU and death. So, you know, I would agree with you on that. Let's be optimistic and, and continue to think that. But again, if you are an individual or you know somebody who may be more at risk of severe disease, make sure you're up to date with your vaccination. And if you have concerns or problems with going to certain situations and you can avoid those situations and you can still always wear a mask. And I say the rules of infection control, they continue to protect you wherever you go. And just remember, now that they're going down to age 50, I'm going to barely qualify for my next vaccination. And right. I think, I don't know if Hawkeye's going to make it, but I'm going to barely qualify. Almost. And Bruce Toby, he'll be well in there, as you'll learn about him in just a moment. <laughs> but you know, the other thing, just to say, there's a nice uh, report yesterday in the New York Times, and, and maybe we can talk about it here a little bit more tomorrow, too, in which the um, they looked at the number of, of possible genetic mutations that still exist within uh, SARS-CoV-2, the actual virus itself causing COVID-19. They did a nice job, it's a nice report of looking at how many more different types of combinations you can have. Here's the take home message. This, this virus is still in widespread transmission in our community, not like it was before. And also everybody feels so much safer. I feel safer. Hopefully everybody's feeling a little safer. But at the end of the day, there still is SARS-CoV-2 out there. If you get vaccinated, you help decrease the incidence of person-to-person -person transmission without question. And therefore, you decrease the opportunity that this, this, this virus has to mutate and try to find a worsened form. Because remember, what we know is that mutations tend to drive transmissibility, then the randomness of the mutations can make it more or less deadly. And so we don't want to take into account that randomness. We know how to handle the, the transmissibility. If we can just get people vaccinated, that'll be a big win for all of us. And in addition, keep our whole area safe. Dr. Seitz, we're going to check in with you here in just a bit. We're talking about running today, so we're going to find out what uh, your philosophy and if you if you work running into your workout regimen. So we'll talk yeah, about Bruce that. Yeah, Bruce Toby here. stopped me a few years ago. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so we're going to get caught up with them here in just a moment. So make sure you get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, on Facebook, and on the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. Any reporter questions on the line today for us? All right, well, more than 1 million people nationwide take part in marathons worldwide every year. And they have good reason to. Research says runners suffer less depression, lower blood pressure, and live five years longer on average. But if you're not running correctly or on the right foot, so to speak, it can cause major damage. And we've got the experts with us today joining me this morning to talk about marathon running, running in general, even if you just do it for fun. Um, so we just want to talk about how to stay in good shape and how to do it right. Dr. Bruce Toby, he's the retired chair of orthopedics and sports medicine here at the health system. And uh, he also sees some of our patients in the Great Bend area. Also, Dr. Nicole Yedlinski, a family medicine and sports medicine physician here at the health system as well. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. I know that patients are your passion, but a, a very close second would be running, correct? Absolutely. Correct. Dr. Yedlinski, you said you could talk for hours about running. So, well, we're going to um, steal some of those moments from you here today. How has COVID impacted just running for you during this pandemic and training and getting ready for marathons? Yeah, I think more people have uh, turned to running as a great way to get some physical activity in a in a safe way because they can go outside and be be separate from people and, and not have to worry so much about COVID transmission that way. Um, so I've been seeing a, a big uptick in my patient population of people who have been getting out there and getting running or even just walking. Dr. Toby, what about you? How was, how was running during the pandemic for you? I mean, what a perfect uh, pastime to be doing and a perfect passion to be outside to be safe. It is, certainly from a fitness standpoint, right. uh, it was a good opportunity. But what happened, all the races ended. Yeah. And so for about two years, almost no races occurred. The Boston Marathon, for example, was canceled for two years in a row. They ran a sort of a special marathon back in September. But this will be the, the race that's coming up in April. 
will be the first time that they've ran it on the regular time since 2019. And you will be at it. Indeed. Correct. Yes. Okay, so tell us now, I got to jump in on that. Tell us a little bit about what that process is like preparing for the Boston Marathon and just what it's like to be selected. Well, it's, it's quite the process because you have to qualify. Yeah. It's one of the few races where you just can't say, well, I'm going to run it. You have to actually show up and get a qualifying time. And then the real fun begins, or the real agony, depending on how you look at it, and that is the training. But actually, the training is where you should get a lot of your pleasure out of it, and also that's where you get your fitness. And hopefully what comes is that you go from just being fit, which I think people like Dana, who's over there, always is fit, and Steve's always fit. But then you can, when you train, you become super fit. And that's kind of a nice, nice thing to do. Well, I like what you said. Enjoy the process. It's yes, it's the process getting up to the marathons. Dr. Yelinsky, you have you have ran those marathons. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to prepare for that. How long in advance, and and just tell us kind of your process and method. Yes, yeah, so certainly a lot of that will depend on the race itself, how much training needs to go into the process. Most people will follow a, a 12 to 16 week process for training up for a marathon distance. Uh, in more recent years, I've gotten into um, distances longer than a marathon, so sometimes that uh, involves a little bit uh, longer of a process. Um, as with anything, too much, too soon, too fast is not always the best way, and that's how a lot of people end up either injured or not really enjoying the process. So I would say work with a sports medicine physician or work with a coach or work with, uh, there's lots of different training plans you can use to train safely for a race. Dr. Toby, how are you training for this Boston Marathon, especially since two years, haven't had one, haven't right. been as competing as much? How, how is that going for you? Uh, I did a qualifying race in September, and then I've been pretty much training for about six months. And what does that look like on a daily basis? Uh, well, what I do is, um, because of my age, and I guess I'm an older runner, I like to say mature runner, yeah. what I do is I run every other day, and I sort of control my mileage. I don't try to do too many miles. And then if my body's saying, don't run today, I don't. And I think that's one of the important things is don't push yourself too hard. Dr. Stites, he's a mature runner. Are you? You're a mat, you're a mature runner, if you will. Um, do you? I, do you? I, I, I was. I was a were. mature runner, Jess. <laughs> that that went so a few years ago. And this is why running is the best sport. I love to run. I love that endorphin high afterwards. Ran all the way since I was 14 until I was 45. And and I talked to Bruce, who sent me to Doug Burton, one of our fine back specialists, who looked at me and said. So if running makes your back worse, why do you keep doing it? And uh, that effectively ended my running career, and I switched into spinning and other forms of aerobic and anaerobic exercise. And I think the key is, um, if you look at your own health, running is a great form of exercise. No two ways about that, because it's so accessible to everyone. But the, um, but the reality is sometimes you'll have orthopedic injuries that prevent you from doing that or other challenges. And so the key is to keep moving. You know, we had that session last week. You just got to keep moving, whether it's running, spinning, you know, swimming. Pick your pick your form. The best form of exercise is the one you're going to do. Well, and let's talk about the wear and tear on the body. Have you both felt that? How do you um, how do you help prevent that? Prevent the injuries? I mean, there's an art to running and doing it well, right? Well, I think it's really important to know um, that that whole um, uh, traditional. Thing that was taught to say that running causes arthritis is actually not true. Um, there's no, uh, it's not like tires on a car, there's no mileage that you need to uh, stay under over your lifetime. And actually we know that running and weight bearing exercise is actually healthy for our joints. So we want to stay active, we want to stay moving. Um, so really in order to do it safely, just make sure that you're talking to your physician. If you need consultation with a sports medicine physician, by all means, utilize the resources that we have, physical therapists, athletic trainers, all of those individuals can help you to make sure that you're running safely so that you can continue running for a lifetime. What's uh, the high you get from running? When I watch people out there early in the morning, out in the cold, running, I'm thinking they must really be getting something really good out of this. Uh, what is that inside feeling for both of you? Yeah. Well, I would think that, that when I get the good feeling, it's not while I'm running, but it's when I finish running, to be <laughs> honest with you. And uh, there is a certain pleasure in that. And as uh, I think it's actually not endorphins, uh, I'll have to correct Steve. I rarely can correct Steve on anything, but I think it's actually a, a different chemical that they've uh, isolated at this point, and it makes people feel better. Um, I, I think also that there's a, uh, um, again, this idea that you've accomplished something. Mm -hmm. uh, before I go further, I want to say that, that for many people, 
I'm not sure that running, at least running a lot, is a good idea. I think if you have some type of uh, uh, malalignment or other problems in your joints, maybe choose to do something more like walking or walk run. There is nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. And we can see some people who are extremely fit who really don't run at all. What are the feelings you get, Dr. Yedlinski? I absolutely love running. It really just brings such a great uh, sense of accomplishment uh, for me um, to get out there. I do most of my running on trails out in the woods um, and just being in nature and, and, and feeling that personal satisfaction of moving my body forward. Uh, like what Dr. Toby said, I agree completely. Um, you can do a uh, combination. A lot of individuals will do what's called intervals, which is where they run for a certain distance or a certain period of time, and then they walk for a certain period of time. Um, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, like what Dr. Stite said, I'll, I'll echo that, really. Uh, the important thing is to, to keep your body moving, to keep your body healthy. What about the difference between outside training for a marathon versus on a treadmill? Yeah, I utilize both. Uh, really, especially during the week in the mornings, I get up early uh, and I hop on my treadmill and that makes it super easy, super quick. I don't have to think about it. My alarm goes off, put my clothes on, get on the treadmill. Um, so there really uh, is great benefit to doing that. Um, on the weekends when I have more time is when I really like to go out in the woods, get some long runs in, um, and that just really also feeds your soul. Yeah, you mix it up a little bit. Yeah, Dr. Absolutely. Stites, last week you were talking about the importance of replacing your shoes, right? I do, and I think Dr. Toby and uh, both of our guests will probably echo that today, Jess. You know, I have those patients come in and they, 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 they're folks who exercise. We try and tell all of our chronic lung patients, you gotta walk, you gotta walk, you gotta walk. And um, then they come in and then they, their, their joints hurt, their knees hurt, their feet hurt, their hips hurt, and their back hurts. The first thing I ask them is how often they've been changing their shoes. And again, mm -hmm. you, know, you can go out and buy those long distance shoes that Bruce probably does. And, and you know, those were $200 pair of shoes, but not, you really don't need that, especially if you're gonna walk. You just need a good pair of cushion shoes, but you gotta replace them every 300 miles or so. And, and if you don't, you're gonna end up losing the cushion. If you lose the cushion, you're gonna end up transmission, transmitting more of that pain into your joints, I think. So I bet our guests will have something say about that too. Yeah. What's your best shoe advice, Dr. Toby? Um, well, I'm sort of a shoe junkie. I, I, I must have 70 <laughs> pairs of running shoes. My wife keeps telling me, you've got to throw them out. You've got to throw them out. But what I do is I uh, rotate them and I rarely wear the same pair of shoes twice in a row. So I, I alternate before 70. them. That's like my homes numbers. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's outrageous. It is. You do. Me. Addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yelinski, what's your shoe advice? You know, I think that there's a reason why there's 3,000 different uh, brands and types yeah. of shoes out there. And you really have to get out and try different types to figure out which shoe it is that works for you. I agree with Dr. Stites, it doesn't have to be a $200 pair of shoe. Um, I will say though that the shoe should feel comfortable right out of the box. Uh, running shoes, walking shoes, you should not have to break in. So if you put on a pair of shoes and it doesn't feel right for you, try a different one. There's lots of resources too that we can utilize to make sure that you're uh, wearing the shoe that is right for you. We're going to get out to the Sports Performance Center here in just a moment, but uh, quick. Oh, I guess we're going to do it now. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to ask you a really important question. What do you listen to while you're out there running? My heartbeat. Your heartbeat. You don't yeah. listen to music, no. podcasts, nothing. Ooh, no. that's I mean, intense. I run really long yeah. distance, um, and so it varies. Sometimes I'll just listen to my heartbeat, listen to my footfalls, listen to the woods around me. Sometimes I'll listen to music, and then sometimes I'll listen to podcasts too. That's my other favorite. Okay, so you guys are really taking in the moment. I'd be like blasting yeah. Van Halen in my head, and I like do that, ruining yeah, the yeah, whole yeah, moment. Yeah. yeah, I want you to know that sometimes music is a great lift. It gets you going. Yeah. Dr. Seitz, what do you listen to when you're working out? I've never, I have to ask you that. What's on your... You no, know, you don't want to know. I listen to a lot of bluegrass, country, oh, uh, yeah. rock, uh, some uh, Broadway. I love Broadway. And uh, probably just a lot of different mix-ups. Yeah, that's where you can kind of just, you know, let it go. Yeah. No one's, no and, one's and judging you for what you're listening to. wants to know, the music is loud. The loud. My <laughs> friends don't like me for that. Uh, yeah. I bet, I bet. The louder the better sometimes. Dr. Hawkinson, have to bring you into this conversation. Yeah. Um, you work out pretty much daily. You're up early. Mm -hmm. um, you've been changing your diet lately. Yeah. So kind of what are your secrets? You said you run, but you said you said you only run a short distance, three or five miles. To yeah, me, that's a very long miles. distance. Not too long. Not like uh, training for a marathon or anything, I don't think. 
You ran today, right? Uh, I did just for a little bit on the treadmill. Yeah. Good for but you. But we get outside and yeah. Wow, yeah, saw patients, good. ran a few miles. Good for you. I try Impressed. not to listen to myself when I'm What do you running. listen to? Um, probably just podcasts. It's all about science and SARS-CoV-2 podcasts. So oh, that I can come on here and inform the public. There you go. All right. Okay, thank you for indulging me in that information. Okay, so uh, preventing injuries is just one step many take to stay on course during their career as a marathon runner. We want to head back out live with Alexis Del Cid joining us from the Sports Medicine and Performance Center out in Overland Park with how 3D technology is helping these runners out. Good morning, Alexis. Jess, this is the coolest system. It's called the Running Gate Analysis Program. I'm here with Ryan Sloop. He's in charge of the whole shebang. He's at the, at the Sports Medicine Performance Center. He's also a personal trainer. You've hooked all these doodads up to me. One came off. Can oh, I just hook okay. it right yeah, there? Yeah, just replace that. Okay, what do these do? So we have 35 anatomically placed markers that are going to help to digitally recreate your skeleton once the cameras uh, capture your running trials. And you put these over everywhere, even on my head. Why do you need to put one on my forehead? So this is a pretty comprehensive system that's going to look uh, from the ground up all the way up through the spine and the okay. head um, so we can see every type of movement throughout your body. And Dr. Stites was talking about how he used to run, which by the way, I think Dr. Stites would be so much fun to run with because mm -hmm. One, if it wasn't the music blasting, he would probably talk your ear off. Yeah. Like he'd regale you in stories from the hospital exactly. or his life or whatever, but he stopped running because he had back pain. Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of thing that can help people who are watching who might have back pain or knee pain get through that and keep running if that's what they love to do? Absolutely. Uh, kind of piggybacking off what they said, um, the extrinsic factors that you uh, go through, the, your training volume and frequency, this allows us to kind of look intrinsically and see um, things like your dy dynamic mobility through your hips, knees, and ankles to see if that's contributing to some type of dysfunction which is causing pain. Ryan's going to put me through a little bit of a course here, but I want to talk about how this is available to pretty much anyone who wants to use it, who can come here and try it. In fact, you recently had a high schooler who came here and tried the running gate analysis program to help with his high school running. Take a look at how that turned out. Yeah, that looks pretty good. All the markers are relatively where they should be. What you're looking at is not the next generation of robots, rather something even better. I think it's pretty cool. 13 year old Mason Medellin may look a little bionic as he runs on the treadmill. We're going to take him through our Qualysis 3D motion capture running analysis. The 3D motion running analysis is a leading motion capture technology for sports biometrics at the University of Kansas Sports Medicine Performance Center. This report gives us so many different anatomical kind of reports. So how exactly does this work? We caught up with the Liberty Middle Schooler to find out. It's really helpful because it shows me my form and tells me what I need to fix. To get that data, Mason must be outfitted with 35 special 3D markers. All right, on the forehead. Let's go on your arms here. Wiggle that second toe for me. They're placed all over his body to track him as he runs at three different speeds. When I say go, I just want you to look straight ahead and run like you're running down the road. These 3D cameras are using the data from the markers attached to Mason to show his skeleton in action on this computer. All right, looking good, Mason. Are you ready to speed it up a little? He'll complete three rounds of running, slow. All right, hold that position for 10 seconds. So the system is capturing right now. Medium. Three, two, one, go. And fast. It gives you the visual representation of what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. That data will be used to help him when he's running on the field and on the track. My feet tend to like push in whenever I'm running. Now with this new information in hand, Mason is armed with a new running form, one he says will make him faster. So they gave me stretches and I changed it. Changes that will help Mason and others just like him get ahead in the game. I would say if you're doing any sports, it would just really help. So back here live at the Sports Medicine Performance Center, Ryan's getting me hooked up on this treadmill and I'm going to do the slow, medium, fast. While this is happening, Ryan, these cameras are all taking different angles of Correct. my joints and my bones and yes, things Yes, so like we that. want to get a comprehensive view. We've got 10 um, infrared cameras that are going to capture the movement of the markers, along with two HD video cameras that we can go back and look at later to actually uh, visually look at your gait. Now, physical therapist Dana, you're over there. What, Dana, what are you looking for and what are you doing? I'm looking at everything literally from the ground up, like Ryan said. Okay. So I'm looking at things at your feet. Are you getting enough mobility into your feet? Are you getting enough mobility in the hips? Are you getting too much mobility in the hips? 
We can look at the knees, we look at the elbows, and we even look at the top of your head. If there's anything that we see, if you're tilted one way or the other, if you have a preference for rotation one way or another, and we can take all of that data then that it gives us to break down what might be happening that's causing your knee pain or your back pain. Okay, I'm going up to the medium now. Would you say like this? Yeah. All right, so I have knee pain. Sure. And I don't think I have very good form, mm -hmm. which is why. And right I now we I are that's... capturing that running for yeah. you. Can you see anything instantly that I'm doing wrong? I can see that you don't get a lot of hip extension, so you like to keep those hips more forward, and that's going to put a lot more stress on the front of those knees when you're so running. That explain it. How's Mason doing now? Do you guys? Mason uh, was given some exercises for his running that I believe he's been working on um, and improving some of his uh, gait as well with that. How long does it take to get the results, Dana? So Ryan will actually go through all of um, your trials after this. He'll compile that data. That takes about half an hour just to compile that data through the system. And then I get those later in the day, and it takes me about 45 minutes to go through your full analysis. But I'm not going to be running for a half hour, right? You are not going to be running okay, for good. half an hour. I mean, I could totally run a half hour. Yeah. Just kidding. I don't feel like running a half hour right now. So tell me this. There are people watching right now who want to come here and try it. Sure. How much does it cost? Does insurance cover it? That was great questions. This is a self-pay cash-based service. Um, we have two really different levels of this service that we offer. Um, the lowest level for $99 will get you access to your online report, uh, which we will send you, as well as uh, Dana or another physical therapist's um, analysis, the breakdown of that data. The higher level of this, which will be $199, in addition to that, you get uh, everything as stated previously, plus a home exercise program. So do you think I gave you enough information? Yeah, we, we got a, 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 few, uh, a few trials there is uh, really enough to, to kind of see uh, what's going on. Yeah. How long does it take to correct form or something that you see that's wrong, typically? That's really, uh, I, I would say, based on your experience level and the level of dysfunction that you've got going right. on. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then my last question would be, I don't know if at home you guys have had this or Jess or Dr. Seitz, um, when you try to correct one thing, something else starts to hurt. Sure. Is that where the regular visits here to the performance center come into play? Absolutely. We have the ability to get you in to see a physical therapist one-on-one uh, -on -one if it uh, does come to that. This is pretty neat. Uh, I got to say, I didn't even know something like this existed. So to be able to come out here, get, get hooked up with all these sensors, do this on the treadmill, and then be able to look at your form on the computer, it feels like an avatar. This is super cool. Uh, so here at the University of Kansas Health System, Sports Medicine and Performance Training Center. This is where you can come to go through this and have this done and just check out your form and see if you can help protect those knees and that back and your hip joints, protect it all so you can keep doing the sports that you love. I'm gonna toss it back to you in the studio. Any questions, guys? Yeah, I, well, first of all, that's new level reporting. You're on a treadmill asking and answering questions <laughs> with a mask on. So I'm quite impressed, I have to say. Um, and then secondly, I, I need to know. I wouldn't wind up on a blooper reel. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, like where you just slide off. <laughs> well, and then I just want to let you know, the new standard, right. the standard this morning is three to five miles. Dr. Hawkinson did three to five miles, so I'm going to need you to jump back on there. Oh, no. <laughs> and then report back to us. All right. I mean, Take Jess, a breath. I would you only do, do this for you. Okay. okay. You All right, we'll see you in just a few, too. okay? So, uh, Dr. Toby, Dr. Blinsky, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on this 3D analysis. Oh, I, I think it's excellent. Well, I put a plug in for the Performance Center, though. Yeah. Uh, Dana and uh, Ryan are true experts, mm -hmm. and it's not mm -hmm. like that they're going to just put you in this machine. They actually can analyze things, and I think they can help people a lot. And I think there is great value in that. I participated in a number of research projects along with Scott Mullen, part of our sports medicine uh, uh, group and uh, looking at uh, athletes and shoe wear and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think there's great value in it. Yeah, um, my son participated, he's a soccer player and he participated in their ACL prevention program and it was fantastic. It was such a great experience for him and really helped him learn how he can uh, play better and hopefully prevent injuries. Well, and, and not all running is created equal. I thought you just kind of go out and you, we think you just walk out yeah. the front door and do it. And now we see with this 3D analysis that there is a skill and there's an art and there's a way that you hold your body and, you know, try to make sure that you're keeping those, you know, injuries at bay. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you, Dr. Yedlinski, before we get to a few community questions, what is an ultra marathoner? 
Yeah, so so I'm a I'm an ultra marathoner. It means uh, just that any distance greater than a marathon. So um, for most individuals, sort of the entry is what we say a 50 kilometer race. So that's 31 miles. Um, but uh, I've done races up to 100 miles, and uh, even there's some races longer than that. Wow. What do you think of that? Are you an ultra marathoner yet? Level uh, yet? No, I don't think I wish to do so. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I think that there's there's a, a great deal of, a deal of enthusiasm now yeah, for yeah. ultra marathoning. It is a different game than marathoning. Oh, for sure. And that for sure. you have to be very um, uh, acutely aware of your nutrition, yeah. mm -hmm. your rest, and all those type of things. The people that do it are very extraordinary. So well, I take my hat off. All right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, let's talk about that. I want to ask about nutrition. Oh, yeah. Leading yeah. up to, I mean, you probably all around good nutrition in general, but leading up to one of these races, uh, I think what it's are you super eating? important, right? So not just for uh, ultra marathons, marathons, any race in general, it always should go down to the fundamentals of uh, these individuals who want to participate in any race paying attention to things like sleep, nutrition, stress reduction, all of the fundamentals of just good health and well-being uh, are even magnified more when somebody undertakes one of these endeavors. What do you eat um, or don't eat? Uh, well, I, I, what I do is I um, ingest calories during the event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that that's what, when people talk about hitting the wall, what happens is that they run out of glycogen or glucose, glucose stores. And so what you have to do, at least for someone of my weight, I have to ingest about 500 calories to make it through a marathon. And so I'll um, use some uh, 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 little supplements that they have in packages I won't give the brand names of them, but I also drink Gatorade as opposed to just pure water. And are water. you stopping along the way to do this? Kind of, uh, tell I'm, us how I'm that works. eating as I'm running because run I eat. don't want to slow down at all. Okay. This, this is the marathon is truly a timed event, and, and you want to move. So running. it is a timed event, but are people slowing at all and taking breaks at all? How does that? Work? What does a break look like during a marathon? Uh, in, in, Non-existent. Yeah, I don't think that, that there you're taking very many breaks except the uh, unfortunate bathroom break that occurs occasionally. <laughs> okay. But in the ultra marathon yeah. world, that's a different game. You want to talk different about Different game yeah. entirely, yeah. So much like what Dr. Toby said, uh, during a marathon, you know, you're really trying to run as fast as you can, so your breaks are quite limited. Um, during an ultra marathon, it's a, it's a much different uh, situation where oftentimes we are eating as we're running, and sometimes we utilize those uh, prepackaged type gels or chews or things like that but also we're eating real food along the way just because when you're running 31, 50, 100 miles, uh, you just have to take in real calories. So it's a lot of easily digestible things like grilled cheese, quesadillas, uh, On the peanut run. butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah, you have, which you have to I practice. I could totally do this. So, <laughs> so that's the other thing too, is it's really important during your training runs, whether it's for a marathon or an ultra marathon, you have to practice. And I really recommend that race day is not the time to try something new. So whether you're talking about shoes, clothes, food, uh, whatever it might be, you really want to uh, use your training to practice anything that you're going to do on race day because, uh, you know, there's nothing like something going wrong to derail your marathon or an ultra marathon. Don't experiment. So don't experiment. Right. Yeah. Practice everything in training. Um, and that's one of the mantras is to never try anything new on race day. All right. You had me at grilled cheese. Grilled cheese. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. you could do that. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Put it in your pocket. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Okay, so we talked about this. Um, you know, I don't run, but I have lots of friends who do, and yeah. I'm always in awe of them getting up and, and committing to that. But there's a lot of people who just mentally might start off the first of the year and say, you know, I really want to train for a marathon. Maybe they never have before. It's just maybe a personal goal. How does how does one get started with something like that, physically and mentally? Well, it's always by taking that first step, literally and figuratively. But what you want to do is probably not plan on, on doing a marathon if you're just starting to run. Sure. What you want to do is to kind of get yourself in shape and maybe start with a walk-run type routine mm -hmm. and then maybe try a 5K, 10K. Mm -hmm. uh, and then nowadays the most popular race probably is more of a half marathon mm -hmm. than marathons. And a half marathon is a very good challenge and a good one to start with. I think I would probably recommend for everyone, before you do a marathon, do a half marathon. Uh, I think you might find that it's more enjoyable to do the marathon after you've done a half marathon. Where do I start? 
Yeah, I agree with everything Dr. Toby said. If you have any underlying medical conditions, it might be worthwhile for you to consult with your physician uh, to get just a quick clearance mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, it's safe for you to embark on a training plan. And then a great way to start out is that walk to run transition, uh, running intervals, especially if you've never run before. Um, there's a mantra we have in sports medicine of you don't want to do anything too much, too soon, too fast. That's how you end up injured or really not liking the process. So if it's something um, that you really want to start doing, running, um, start out slow start out easy and then kind of gradually increase from there. I'm also a big fan of running in groups. Find uh, a, a training group, find um, other folks who are out there who are just starting running and, uh, and, and make it into a social endeavor. Do you need to find out if you have any heart issues before you start down this journey? Um, I think it makes good sense, particularly for the older runners to yeah, do that. Right. I think that makes good sense. One thing I would add to what Nicole was saying is that I think to have a mentor makes good sense. Mm -hmm. In other words, someone who's done it before and maybe can show you the ropes. I was fortunate that the uh, chair of urology, Jeff Holtzberlein, was my mentor, yeah. despite the fact that I'm a number of years mm -hmm. older than he is, but nevertheless, he was a great help for me. Oh, that's yeah. great. All right, so I'm going to get to some community questions, guys. Let's do that real quick. All right, so Ruth wants to know, Ruth Allen is asking, is there value in analyzing someone who walks for exercise? I don't know if that's something we might be able to send out to Alexis. Oh, for, do, yeah, just ask questions. about is walking. Bruce? Is it evaluating walking beneficial at all? Ryan? Yeah, so uh, the question was, would evaluating walking be beneficial? And I, I think we, we certainly could do that with this system. Um, it would be more uh, of a kind of an offhand thing, but the, the data within the system itself is comparing to marathon runners in Europe. Um, so the gait would be a little bit different, but it's something that we could actually do, yes. What's interesting is how quickly Dana was able to just see instantly from looking at, at my slow jog and what I was doing was she could see clearly what was making my knees hurt. So that's, mm -hmm. this is such a great resource. Yeah. Another question, Alexis. Um, Lou is curious, how does this work with someone who maybe does multiple sports like hockey, soccer, basketball, ah. even something like bowling? Um, with, with just having, making sure that you're walking and, and sitting up straight and properly, would that help at all? Would this type of technology help with just other sports other than running? And I'm going to relay that to, to Dana as well. Dana doesn't have the earpiece. So Lou wants to know if this also works with multiple sports, people who play hockey or basketball and do other things, will that help with their entire physique? So we do also use this for golf, which Ryan can talk a little bit more about the golf program as well, mm -hmm. and baseball. So we can use it actually for a multitude of different things. This specific one is just running specific. As Ryan said, we use that data with marathon runners. But this um, technology is something that we could take for further than that as well. So you do it for people's golf swings, right? Yeah, we have the ability to do it with golf, uh, both both baseball throwing and hitting, um, actually cycling. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's kind of a free range module called functional assessment where we really can do any movement that we, we want to analyze. So and how long have you had this here? We've had this system a little over a year, about a year and a half. So it's a bit of a learning curve and we're, we're trying to bring those other programs up. But this running program has been kind of the yeah. flagship program and it's going very well. Cool. Alexis, another question is from Ashley is if is this best for someone who's younger or what if somebody has been running a while and maybe, you know, oh, maybe he's in their 40s or 50s and wants to try to correct something that's gone wrong? That's a good question from Ashley as far as if this is better for younger runners or can could a senior do this to see if they could do anything better? Yeah, we, we don't have any limitations on age. We've had, you know, we highlighted Mason and at the time he was in middle school and we've had runners in their 60s and 70s come do this as well. And is it All usually right. people who are just starting out their sport or is it people who've been doing it for a long time and are having problems? We've had a really wide range of people that have been doing it. Um, Ryan said we've had high school cross country athletes doing it and then we've had people doing it um, that have done marathons for 20 plus years. So there's really no time that you're missing. Um, you can come anytime during your running career. We can change things um, as early as, as high school and as, early, as late as 70s. Cool question from Barbara for both of our doctors here in studio is what inspires you to run? 
Wow. Um, <laughs> What's I just, the short answer on that? I, I think the short answer for me is I'm uh, fascinated by the limits of human endurance. I'm fascinated by what our bodies can do. And I really feel like it makes me feel better as a person when I'm out there moving my body. Dr. Toby? Uh, for me, it was the pursuit of fitness. I've always tried to keep fit all my life. And then at a certain point, the, the competition uh, came out and I enjoyed the competition. It's part of who I am and what I am. And so that's why I do the racing. But uh, running, I think, is good for overall fitness and wellness. And people that do it, I think it will find those, uh, those attributes. And if you missed it early, earlier, Dr. Toby is going to be uh, running in the Boston Marathon next month, correct? In April. April in 18th. April. Um, and so you're, you're starting to ramp things up to get ready? Or? No, it's just the opposite. Oh, you're what chilling I'm out. Doing just, yeah, what I'm doing is the taper. The, and the taper is when you kind of slow it down a little okay. bit and let your body kind of recover from this, you know, six-month training cycle. Uh, Dr. Yedlinski, a dream of yours is to run in the New York Marathon? or I would love to do New York City Marathon. I've done some road marathons. I've done four of them. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, so I would love to to run New York City one day. Oh, so what is what happens? How do you how do you get there? How do we get you there? <laughs> do I have to call? right now, right now I'm focusing on some of the the longer distances and then uh, maybe maybe in a few years I'll go back to okay. to marathons. We'll be rooting you on for sure. Okay, let's get some final thoughts. Um, Alexis, I'm going to start out with you at the Sports Performance Center. Just just final thoughts from um, Ryan and just you know, just what we need to know if we want to utilize this technology. Ryan, what would you have to say to our viewers about that? So uh, if you do want to sign up for this, we offer this uh, um, at least once a month, um, several times a month if necessary based on volume. And to sign up for an appointment, you can give us a call at 913-239-0646 uh, and ask for myself to sign up for an appointment. Dana, it must be so fulfilling to be able to help people pretty instantly when they come in here. Absolutely. It's also really great too when we get a whole lot of them in one day and then uh -huh. we can actually compare kind of see everything that we have that's going on with people. I know that there's so many people out there that can use this and would really benefit from this. Yeah. And then following up with them after the fact to see where they're at with their running career. Yeah. Ryan? Jess? All right, Ryan, Dana, Alexis, thank you so much for joining us out there this morning. And uh, Dr. Gett, Oh, I gotta get back on the treadmill. Yeah. Oh, Jess yes. made me yeah. Yeah. work it out. Let's get it. All right, let's get do going, it. Get going, get going. Okay. So uh, right. just thoughts um, on, just your final thoughts on just a, a budding runner, maybe somebody like me who would step out there for the first time. Just use your final thoughts what we should know. Yeah, I think that uh, running is a fantastic uh, endeavor, athletic endeavor. Um, and if you want to try it, get out there and start doing it. Um, but understand that running isn't for everyone. And so for me, I just want to see people moving. I want to see people um, get that fitness that Dr. Toby was talking about. Well, Jess, the weather's turning beautiful out there. Everything looks great. It's the perfect time to try running at this point. Oh, point. I yeah. see. Go ahead, have it. <laughs> I, I would need you to, right, in between. I'd have to have one of you on either side of me to train me along the way. So, well, thank you. This has been really great. Good luck next month. Thank you. And thank you so much for your insight and, and helping us understand just what it takes to... Yeah to run at your level. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawkinson, your final yeah. thoughts today. Yeah, just echoing, um, you know, the comments of our guests. It's, it's important to be healthy um, in mind, body, and spirit. And I think being outside and doing those things, either walking or running or the combination of the two really helps and adds to that. So. All right, well, tomorrow is National Doctors' Day. And here's a way you can say thank you to healthcare workers all around. Um, a lot of you ask how you can show your gratitude. Well, you can do that right here by hovering your phone, your camera over that QR code right there. It's gonna take you to an email and there you can leave a nice note or you can send us a 30 second video so that we can air those right here on air. And thank you so much for being with us today. And don't forget you can catch our shows anytime on Facebook, YouTube, or on Twitter. Tomorrow, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. Being a true sports fan can bring you joy and then it can break your heart. So how do you cope with the ups and downs of cheering on your team? Jayhawks in the final four, the Chiefs in the playoffs year to year, and now it's baseball season. It can take a toll on those emotions. The good, the bad, and the ugly, we're gonna hear from experts on sports-related stress. Is it a real thing? Join us for Open Mics with Dr. Stites tomorrow at eight. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.